So what we want to talk about before the uh, is the last material from the midterm one exam. What we want to talk about before we move off of these kinds of money markets and credit markets and go on into monetary policy is we want to talk about bank capital. Now we've discussed again what are the four services of money: medium of exchange, unit of account, store of value, speculative asset. We've looked at those services in terms of what we define as the money markets, right? Cash, checking, savings accounts, money market, mutual funds. We've also looked at this in terms of bond markets, which are kind of money, but not quite, because they provide that store of value, but not necessarily a medium of exchange. And we've looked at equity markets that provide that speculation, but that store of value is very risky. And we have this a uh, bit of a comparison of what happens with the money markets versus the bond markets versus the equity markets. But we want to also address uh, what is the very large elephant in the market, which is bank capital, indirect finance. Remember, the indirect finance in this case is going to be uh, more important and more significant than direct finance that you can get from, say, bonds or commercial paper. Bonds and equities provide less than half of all external funding needed by firms, which is to say... If we need more store of value speculation and medium of exchange, we don't have enough just in money markets, bond markets, and equity markets to account for it. Financial intermediaries, like banks, provide external funds for business, right? This is the lending aspect of it. This is the credit aspect of it. Lending by banks provides more finance than stocks and bonds in our economy. And the financial system in which it exists tends to be heavily regulated unless we're talking about the shadow banking system. So governments want to regulate this to provide stability for this indirect finance. Um, and they want to make sure that things are transparent, that they are stable, and this market functions in the way it's supposed to function of someone giving up their current potential consumption and putting it into savings, and that savings be, being converted through indirect finance, through some financial intermediary into lending. But this regulatory environment has the potential to crowd out smaller firms because they will need to put up some collateral, there will need to be contracts, there needs to be auditing. So it becomes uh, a bit of a trade-off when you talk about regulation and finance. We're going to get more regulation, but that can eat into potential returns and profits. On the other hand, that can also reduce risk, which is endemic to these kinds of markets. So financial intermediaries help provide loans that stabilize firms in terms of whether they are growing, whether we're in a recession or an expansion. Governments and central banks intervene in these financial markets in order to promote stability. And really what they want to do is avoid catastrophe, right? We have the FDIC, we have the Fed to try and smooth over the business cycle, to try and keep banks afloat <clears throat> when times are bad. Uh, and maybe then cut into profits when times are good, right? We don't want bank runs, we don't want panics, and we certainly don't want unethical behavior where the incentives of owners and managers or the incentive of depositors and lenders are unaligned, okay? And generally what we want is some amount of assets uh, compared to our liabilities. If we put in $100 into the bank, how much of that 100 is being loaned out? How much of that 100 is being kept back by the bank and put into their Federal Reserve account versus how much is being lended out or loaned out to Main Street? So let's talk about looking at this from a balance sheet perspective. So then we need to talk about the assets of a bank on their balance sheet versus their liabilities. And the assets that they hold, the liquidity they can spend now would be reserves, uh, deposits that other banks have with them, any treasury uh, or other kinds of security bonds, and any loans they have made. Those are the assets of the bank. Now, we could have other assets, buildings, computers, physical assets, et cetera, uh, but the main four ones there are the reserves, deposits, securities, and loans. In terms of liabilities, the checkable deposits, that's a liability. So for me, if I deposit $100 at Amarillo National Bank for a checking account, that's a liability for them because I can call in that value at some point. I can take that back out, all right? 
non-transaction deposits, savings and CDs, right? Those are also liabilities. I could pull out my savings. I could pull out my CD. Uh, borrowings of banks, anything that banks have borrowed from other banks or other financial intermediaries, those are their liabilities. And bank capital. Now, bank capital is the bank's net worth. That's the difference between their assets and liabilities. This is going to be a bit of a catch-all here, right? This is going to serve as a cushion in case of a drop in the value of their assets. So if we have Silicon Valley Bank is holding, I don't know, 30 million in bonds, and outside of their control, the value of those bonds begins to drop precipitously, they need to have a certain amount of bank capital available to cushion the drop in the value of those assets where they're gonna have a rather high leverage ratio to deal with. All right, so let's go with a quick example. Again, um, the accuracy, I'm not too concerned with. Mainly I just wanna show you, okay, we have assets, we have liabilities, and this is how firms, households, and financial intermediaries will behave. So let's say we have a, uh, let's say um, for whatever agent this is, we have some reserves that are 20 million, we have some loans made that are 80 million, and we have some securities owned that are valued at 10 million. So, okay, so this is a bank, right? All right, so um, in terms of the liabilities, they have 100 million in deposits, which they have you know, spread out between these reserves, these loans and purchase of securities. And then they have an extra 10 million there on the liability side that is, uh, for basically that cushion in case the value of those assets change, right? Now, let me uh, note something snarky about my lecture notes. Notice I have written in excess, but crossed it out because there is now no distinction really between excess and required reserves. They both get a uh, interest rate paid to them by the Federal Reserve. So a bank can hold back a million dollars and they'll get, I don't know, somewhere around one, two percent from the Federal Reserve. Um, there used to be, well, there still are required reserves that banks have to hold back, but those are not quite as important anymore. It used to be the banks would not want to hold back required reserves, but now they're holding on to more than required reserves. That would be the excess. But okay, I'm being snarky in this because uh, at least, you know, when I learned economics, we had a very uh, set distinction between excess and reserve requirements, and now it's just reserves in general. We'll talk about that more in a minute. So suppose a bank has no reserves and faces a mild run. They'll have to incur transaction costs to provide liquidity for withdrawals by either borrowing from other banks, selling those securities, borrowing from the Fed, or selling off their loans. Holding a certain amount of reserves avoids the transaction costs of this potential crisis. So if you've ever seen It's a Wonderful Life and the, the famous bank run scene, it's, it's a Great scene. I mean, he goes through this list of things that he can do with the exception of the Fed. They didn't really, you know, go to the Fed way, way back then. He could borrow from Old Man Potter, uh, borrow from another bank, right? He could sell off any securities he might have. He could sell off any loans. What they end up doing is digging into his, uh, his honeymoon assets, right? So, okay. So he sells off some other kind of, of security and asset in order to maintain that balance and provide liquidity to his customers who are panicking at that point, right? Okay, so let's look at how reserves may be different in the 90s and aughts versus after the Great Recession. So in this graph, what I've done is I've put total reserves as a percentage of deposits held by banks. So the intuition being in 1990, banks were holding about two and a half percent of their total deposits in reserves at the Fed. Now, this uh, tended to go down throughout the 90s until, of course, around September of 2001, when the banks suddenly got very scared of something. Who knows what? What was going on in September of 2001? I don't recall. We all know what was going on. Right? That's the September 2001 attacks, right? Twin Towers go down. Banks get panicky. They hold back 1.4% in reserves. Look at that. That is that right there is financial crisis and panic and people being very, very afraid. Now, in September of 2008, during the Great Recession, this jumped uh, from, say, about 0.6% up to about 1.5%. So there's the panic. But luckily, the FDIC and the Fed stepped in, calmed the banks down. They went back to lending. No, they didn't. 
This is post Great Recession holdings of reserves as total deposits, which is to say after September of 2008, banks went from holding 1.5% of all deposits and reserves to holding 10%, 12%, 15%, 20% uh, around 2011. Well, wait, wasn't the Great Recession ending around 2011? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, they're still holding money back. August of 2014, 27.8% of deposits were being held in a Federal Reserve account by banks, right? Now, the difference here is in 2008, the Federal Reserve began offering interest. Before, they would have 0% interest for any reserves held by banks. Now they're offering interest on it. And banks seem to find it more, more profitable to hold those excess reserves than lend them out, right? They don't want to take on that risk. Now, we begin to recover a bit. Banks lend a bit more. They begin to wind down some of those reserves down to about 11% uh, in the, let's see, that's around, uh, yeah, September of 2019. But of course, by April, uh, or March, April, and May of 2020, they of course begin holding a lot more cat, uh, a lot more reserves again, right? Why? COVID, lockdown, et cetera. Uh, they have begun to wind that back down to 20% as of December of 2023. But the basic idea here is banks are holding back money that could be loaned out. Why? Do we really have uh, such a bad amount of risk in 2014 that we didn't in 2008? No, the Fed is offering interest on these reserves, so banks are making the marginal, rational decision to hold more. Okay, so here we have that reserves to deposit ratio. The Fed will try and kind of determine this interest on reserves um, that they have to incentivize firms to either our banks to either hold more reserves or not. We see this kind of downward sloping demand curve in the data along with that zero lower bound, uh, which gives us a nice kind of idea of, of what we're looking at. So we have this cost of holding reserves is reflected by the interest. And we have that downward sloping demand curve to the uh, horizontal zero lower bound line and the uh, vertical inelastic supply of reserve determined by Fed policy. Now let's change up the story a bit because I don't like zero lower bounds. Again, what am I going to say we do? We take the spread. We look at the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost represented by the Fed funds rate minus the interest rate on reserves of a bank lending out to a bank holding back? And that Fed funds rate, remember, that's the overnight lending between banks. So that's going to be a nice low lending rate that we can compare to what should be this low interest on reserves. All right. So we can, again, redefine this in terms of that spread or that user cost. This is going to be that actual price representation. And that will give us our nice downward sloping demand curve if we put this in terms of price without a zero lower bound. And empirically speaking, there it is. No zero lower bound, downward sloping demand curve as our reserves to deposits increases, we end up with this lower opportunity cost, right? So, all right. So do banks want to lend? Because you know, that's the issue with monetary policy is the Fed is supposed to be encouraging banks to lend and people to borrow. Is that what's going on with fiscal stimulus in the recent two decades we've been going through? If reserves are the ammunition that banks use to lend, what's happening when reserve quantity uh, demanded is high? Uh, are they really not lending out as much as they have been before? I mean, do I have a point with this? I'm not sure, right? If we look at commercial and industrial loans up to uh, 2023, looks like they've been growing. Uh, you know, look, we even have uh, some, you know, proof that the monetary and fiscal stimulus in 2020 really kind of bumped up those loans a bit, right? There's the payment protection program. So, yeah, in billions of U.S. dollars, Fed's doing its job, right? Lower interest rates, more lending, more borrowing, more spending. Yeah, that's the thing. Remember, these are billions of nominal dollars. What if we put this in terms of our GDP growth? What if we divide that value of commercial and industrial loans by the value of our economy in general. And what we find is that lending after the Great Recession went down from a level of about 20 to 25 percent to a level of between 15 to 20 percent and stagnated there from 2011 into 2019. 
Yes, the payment protection program boosted that lending, but after COVID, we are still lending less relative to probably where we should be over the past 20 years. Banks are indeed, relative to how our GDP is expanding, lending out either the same or less than the average of the past 20 years. Okay, so, all right. Is this really such, you know, a, a bad thing compared to even, you know, previous eras like the 70s and the 80s? Let's take that data back to 1973. We can see this vacillation, uh, you know, sometimes more lending than trend, sometimes less, less lending than trend. But if we put it into as a percentage of the deposits the banks are holding back, did I say GDP earlier? I think I said GDP, I should be saying deposits. Sorry. Deposits, not GDP. We can do this in GDP and get some of the same results, but all right. Here's that lending in terms of deposits. And since the 19, uh, well, really at this point, even before the Great Recession, uh, since the early aughts, relative to the deposits they receive, banks have been lending less. That is an interesting aspect going on. Why are banks lending less relative to the amount of deposits they are receiving? And again, I can certainly blame the Fed for quite a bit after 2008 and say, well, now you're paying interest on excess reserves. They have even less incentive to lend. But some of this behavior was starting going as far back as 2000, 2001. So in this case, the monetary policy being enacted is having this bad side effect. We're not seeing more borrowing relative to deposits. We're not seeing more lending relative to deposits. Relative to our commercial trend, banks are being fairly tight-fisted about what they are putting out. And the Fed policy that is being enacted and has been enacted the last 20 years, instead of contributing to banks lending more and people borrowing more, may be contributing to banks not lending. Where are banks and financial firms going to go if they need this lending? Where's Main Street going to go? Where are households going to go? They're going to dip into capital markets and they're going to dip into speculative markets. So again, we talked about, you know, if the bond rate is, is low, right? If long-term bonds is low relative to short-term bonds, more people are going to go into equities. They're going to get more risk. They're going to take on more risk to get that higher return. Well, now we have the same thing in lending. So monetary policy, what we incentivize people to do through those interest rates matters. All right, so let's take a look at um, insolvency. Now, a bank needs to maintain a certain amount of this cushion of this bank capital to avoid insolvency. Uh, and if they don't have the sufficient assets to pay off that liability, they get into trouble. Now, how do we measure the solvency of a bank? Well, we've got two questions we need to ask. The first one is, how efficiently is the bank run? And we can get that through the return on assets. That's the net profit after taxes divided by the assets. How efficiently run is our bank? That's the question we're trying to answer with this measure. Return on equity, on the other hand, is, how much are equity holders earning on their investment? Now, notice these are two different questions. One is about how the bank is run. The other one is whether or not equity holders are getting return on their investment, on their shares of ownership within the bank. These are two separate questions and need to be treated as such, um, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. One may be more important to you than the other. One may not be, but fine. We can relate the two of them, though using the equity multiplier. And that's our return on equity is going to be equal to our return on assets times this equity multiplier. Look, if a highly capitalized bank has 100 million in assets, 10 million in equity, it's got a multiplier of 10, right? Lowly capitalized has 100 million in assets, 4 million in equity, then the multiplier is 25. There we go. So if we have a 1% return on assets, a low return on equity is 25%. Uh, the high is going to be our 10%. Okay. Question is, do we want our investors getting lots of return on that equity? Or do we want our bank to be run as efficiently as possible with our return on assets? And those two things don't line up always. Okay. So again, here we are with this risk and return trade-off. Do we want our bank to be highly capitalized, 
with a low equity multiplier? Or do we want it to be lowly capitalized? Do we want the bank to lend out a lot? Or do we want the bank to lend out not as much? How are we doing this? Highly capitalized banks have a lower risk of insolvency, but a lower return on equity. Lowly capitalized have higher risk of insolvency, but also a higher return on equity for those shareholders. So when we are regulating these banks and asking these questions about return on asset, return on equity, remember these are two separate questions. If we require more bank capital, we do help to insure against insolvency, but we dampen potential returns. What I'm trying to get at here is regulation. If we have a large amount of regulation, then we have a safety net, we have stability, we have transparency, but we also have low returns. So there's going to be a trade-off in what we do in terms of regulation and where we go with that. Now, this leads into the question of leverage. Leverage is the ratio of total assets to the bank capital that we have to maintain. All right. Sometimes this is described as uh, with the inverse leverage ratio. Sometimes we flip it over to A minus L over L. Sometimes we use the A over um, A over L. Right, type over here. All right, what did I do? One. A well-capitalized bank would have a leverage ratio exceeding 5% according to US regulation. It's 3% according to the Basel Third Agreement. So in international markets, it may be 3%. Uh, for the U.S., it should be about five, uh, leverage ratio exceeding 5%. Yeah. So a little more flexibility in the U.S. versus the rest of the world, right? Now, we could have uh, different agents facing different leverage cycles. Households tend to behave as passive managers of leverage. If our assets grow in value, if our house grows in value, our leverage declines because we're not going to go out and say, well, my house increased in value. I'm going to go out and get a home equity line of credit immediately so I keep the same amount of leverage that I have. Now, your assets are uh, increasing. That leverage ratio is decreasing. Firms tend to be uh, kind of kind of active, not really. So they may look at that and say, well, the value of our properties has increased. Maybe we can use that to you know, put out more lending or put out more spending, we'll leverage that a bit more. Banks actively manage this. They want that leverage ratio to stay about the same, right? That three or 5%. And security firms are going to aggressively manage this uh, to try and maintain an increasing level of that leverage, but while still, of course, remaining solvent if possible. We can see this uh, in the works of Adrian and Shin in 2010, and then Sir Lettuce at all in 2013. Uh, take a look at this from a monetary perspective, which is a good way to look at it, in my opinion. So again, passive households, are they going to do something about this? So let's say their house increases in value by $1,000, uh, or they own, say, 10000 in equities and their liabilities, and they owe 90000 in their mortgage. Are they going to then go out and leverage um, leverage those liabilities to maintain that 10 leverage ratio? No, they won't. They're going to kind of leave that uh, the same as it was. So we have that 101 minus the 90. They're, they're not going to say, you know, increase their mortgage rate more than that. They're just going to, you know, give them, they're, they're going to let it be, right? So <clears throat> what that would look like empirically is as the asset value grows, leverage growth begins to decline. They do that. This comes from the Z1 survey of the Federal Reserve looking at houses and nonprofits in terms of their asset growth and leverage growth. Banks, on the other hand, securities they hold increases in price, so the value increases. They are then going to manage their debt and their equities. They're going to increase that debt to target that leverage, right? So they've increased their debt here and their liabilities to um, push that leverage ratio back to 10, right? Banks are going to actively uh, manage this. And we see that again in the data. The leverage ratio is not changing as asset is growing along the x-axis, right? Another good example of, say, that flat horizontal curve meaning something. 
Securities dealers, on the other hand, will take that, right? They see their leverage ratio go down, and then they're going to go into more debt. They're going to push that leverage out to take advantage of that leverage. And what we end up doing, um, yep, there we go, is they'll take out, say, even more debt in terms of, say, 110 million, much larger, so that they can uh, push this out. And I've got a funny comic here, and it used to be engineers, but all right. Yes, Spinal Tap, right? XKCD is a great comic. Love, love reading. But you have the person saying, yeah, these amps go to 11. Does that make the amps amplifiers for guitars usually go up to 10? Well, this one goes to 11. Was well, that louder? Well, it's one louder, right? And normal person says, okay, we'll make 10 louder and 10 is still the highest, right? Just rescale. An engineer would say, but 11 doesn't have any units. It's an arbitrary scale mapping out. And then, of course, the person falls asleep. A securities dealer will say, well, for $2,000, I'll build you one that goes to 12. That's what they're doing with your money, all right? You're getting the return. Well, for, <laughs> for a fee, I'll get you even more on that leverage. They actively manage that leverage that's going on. As the assets are growing, that leverage ratio is going to grow as well. Adrian and Shin pointed this out with a lot of the firms that got in trouble in 08 and 09, like Lehman, Merrill, Morgan Stanley, Bear Stearns, Goldman, and Citigroup. They were all actively managing their leverage ratio to push it up, which uh, some of these, you know, are very highly related to banks that maybe should have been maintaining leverage instead of actively pursuing it. So that is bank capital and how that can differ in different markets. So this uh, brings us to the end of our material for midterm one. March 7th <clears throat> is going to be the exam. Exam opens 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on the Blackboard course webpage. In terms of an overall review, what you guys need to look at, you need to look at money markets, these liquid assets, low yield, backed by fiat and backed by debt, right? Securities markets, less liquid assets, higher yield, backed by debt as well. Equities markets, liquid assets, high yield, backed by that ownership of the share, right? Bank capital, money, securities, equities that are in the attempts that are held and moved around to maintain solvency. So we have this behavior going on in certain markets that we want to take a look at before we move on into monetary policy. So put a pin in this video. All right. Any video I post after this video, not going to be on midterm one. Okay, unless it's a review video, which I'm dabbling with right now, there may be a review sheet going out, or of course, also check the Google sheet for potential questions. I'll be working on those uh, most of this week. So otherwise, guys, again, this is the end of midterm one material and best of luck to you. All right, where's my stop button?